Hi everyone. It is the 20th of November 2019. Coming to you after a few weeks or a few months of break. I've been trying to get clarity from the Father about what the heck is going on. We've got a few groups within the community and I've been observing it for many years now. There are some who are proclaiming the rapture. There are some who are proclaiming destruction. There are some who are saying, well, we need to be here through some of it, so let's stock up. Um, I wanted some clarity or where we are, why we're here, what the heck is going on. Because some of it just doesn't make sense anymore, okay? And so today I'm coming to you <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> today I'm coming to you with a question. Is Jesus Christ a liar? Is he a liar? Here's why I'm asking. I know very few people that would have come to the knowledge of um, salvation and story of crucifixion and resurrection and the, the message of Jesus Christ and all that. I know very few people that would have come to know all this without being first told about it in the churches, right? There's very few people who uh, would have studied the Bible without previously having heard all the stories in it, retold to them prior to them actually studying it themselves. You understand? Like you're first told the narrative and then you go to the Bible and you start reading the verses and you're automatically assigning the meaning from what you were previously told instead of <clears throat> using your own discernment or asking in prayer for what it means. And so that was my story too. I was born in 1984 in what used to be Czechoslovakia and uh, my mom got involved with an underground church. Churches were not allowed here back then, especially Protestant churches. Um, and so she got baptized in 1988 when I was four years old and we were part of the underground church. A year later or say two years later, um, the regime collapsed on itself and so the church was no longer underground. Um, and so I've been fed from the church from a very young age, from four years old, okay? <coughs> Excuse me, this is, I'm going to cough a lot, I'm sorry. So, from a very young age, I was told that Jesus is coming. It's just something that was being told, Jesus is coming. Yes, he's been delaying for 2,000 years, but he's coming. And we would sing songs about it, and... And then there was this general, you know knowledge about the end times. It was preached in one way or another about the rapture and about the tribulation and about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And nobody really understood it. There were different theories, but at least it was being spoken of. Okay. <coughs> so then um, when I started read by myself, I would come up to verses that weren't making much sense.
uh, when I tried to fit them into the narrative that the church was giving me, okay? But I would always brush it off because, you know, the pastor knows better, right? And then, fast forward some 30 years, when I felt the call to start studying properly myself four years ago, I will come up, come across um, the verse in Revelation, Revelation 28. He will go out, the devil, he will go out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog. He will gather them for battle. He will go out to deceive the nations. And I would read it over and over and over. And I'm like, hmm. So, this is supposedly at the time when Jesus came back, established this millennial kingdom. And then everybody knows about it because they're living in it for a thousand years. And then the devil is set free again. And what happens then? He comes out and deceives everybody. I'm like, how can he deceive everybody? <coughs> they were just living within the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Like, wouldn't they count a thousand to know that something's going to happen afterwards? So I kept reading that over and over and over. And I'm like, Father, there's a mystery in this. How can he deceive them? And so if they're deceived, how would they know that they're deceived, right? You wouldn't. That's the point of being deceived. You think you know the truth. So let this be an entry to this video. What I want to do is I want to go to the verses that stand out like a sore thumb in the Bible, and I want to ask you, is Jesus Christ a liar? Have you based your whole life on believing the book that is somewhere here that I don't know where it is now, the Bible, yet you're not following truly what he said? Or you're not believing it because it doesn't go with the narrative that you're given which is he's been waiting for 2,000 years to come back why would he do that okay so let's go we'll start in the book of Matthew all right so we got Matthew 10 23 This is after Jesus sent them out, okay, to preach in the cities. He says, whenever they harass you in one city, escape to the next. <laughs> because I assure that you will not go through all the cities of Israel before the human one comes or the son of man comes. Whenever they harass you in one city, escape to the next, because I assure you, you will not go through all the cities of Israel before the human one comes. Let's have a look at different translations. Amplified version, when they persecute you in one city because of your faith in me, flee to the next. For I assure you, and most solemnly say to you, you will not finish going through all the cities of Israel before Son of Man comes. What? Is Jesus Christ a liar? Okay. Go to the next. Matthew 16, 28. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one or the son of man coming in his kingdom. 
Okay. The same is in Mark and Luke. Jesus continued, I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see God's kingdom arrive in power. Are we going to just skip over these verses because it doesn't go with the narrative that you were told? Are we? Same's happening in John chapter 21. This is after Jesus has died and resurrected and now he's He's at the lake, and they're trying to fish, and it's not working, right? And then he's talking to Peter, and he's telling Peter, well, Peter, you're going to die for my name. And then Peter's asking about John. Well, what about John? And Jesus is telling him this. If I want him to remain until I come, what difference does it make to you? You must follow me. Therefore the word spread among the brothers and sisters that his disciple wouldn't die. However, Jesus didn't say he wouldn't die. But only, if I want him to remain until I come, what difference does that make to you? Right? Like, is John here still 2,000 years later, is basically my question. Is Jesus a liar? Have you... That everything in your life on the words of a liar, or not. Or shall we say that he's not a liar, and that what he's saying really means that he was saying he's coming real soon, back then. Yeah? Can we agree to that? No, not this one. Okay, let's go to Matthew 24. All right. <coughs> this, the whole chapter, Matthew 24, is basically what most of the end times watchers, watchmen, have studied to tell you that, yes, we are at the time of Matthew 24, and so on and so forth. So, <coughs> let's see. Now, Jesus left the temple and was going away. His disciples came to point out to him the temple buildings. He responded, Do you see all these things? The buildings. I you sure that no stone will be left on another. Everything will be demolished. So he's pointing to the temple and he's saying it's going to be demolished, right? Now, we already know it's been demolished, because it's not there anymore. Okay? That's nothing new to you. I'm just making sure that we all understand that what he said here has already happened. Now, they're now asking him about it. They're saying, tell us when these things will happen. What things? What he just said, right? He just said it's going to be demolished. So they're saying, hey, when is it going to happen? <coughs> and they're also asking him, what will be the sign of your coming? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? Okay? So they asked him three questions. When will these things happen? The destruction of the temple. Of all of it. What will be the sign of his return? And what will be the sign of the end of the age? And he answers them with the rest of the chapter 24. They're as if it, as if the answer to these three questions is all tied together. It's all one big bag for these three questions. So we already know that the temple is not there anymore. Right? It already happened. So why are we thinking that the, the other two questions, the answers to them, lies in the future?
Okay, let's have a look at this. What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Look what we read in 1 Corinthians 1.11. Or, let's first have a look at, at this word age, because it's, it's been translated as world in KJV, which makes no sense. What will be the sign of the end of the world? No, that's not what it said. It said age. The word age, aeon, means... It means something. It means time, period of time. Here it is. A space of time, an age. All right? So it's a space of time, an age, a cycle of time... Okay, so I'll go back to where it was. All right, so they're asking him for the end of the age that they were presently in. They are connecting it with his coming, all right? And they're connecting it with the temple being destroyed. That's one bundle of things that is supposed to be happening around the same time. All together. <clears throat> the destruction of the temple, him coming back, and the end of the age. So, look what, what um, Paul wrote here. Brothers and sisters, I want you to be sure of the fact that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all went through the sea. All were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from a spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. However, God was unhappy with most of them, and they were struck down in the wilderness. <coughs> These things were example for us, so we won't crave evil things like they did. Don't worship false gods like some of they did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up and they got up to play. Let's not practice sexual immortality like some of them did, and twenty-three thousand died in one day. Let's not test Christ like some of them did. See, he's he's speaking of Christ, but he's talking about Exodus. See, that might mean something for somebody. And were killed by the snakes. Let's not grumble like some of them did. And were killed by the destroyer. Now this is the verse I've been trying to get to. These things happened to them as an example. And were written as a warning for us. To whom the end of time has come. This word is the same as used in Matthew 24. Have a look here. So Matthew 24, 3, right? End of the age, right? What, what, is, what is the sign of the end of the age, right? And then if we go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11 that we just read, it's the same word. End of the age is end of the world, end of the age, right? <clears throat> it's the same word. So... Paul is saying here, these things happen to them as an example and were written as a warning for us to whom the end of time or end of the age has come. He's saying the end has come upon Paul's generation. That same age that the disciples were asking Jesus about in Matthew 24, 3. Okay, so then if we look further in Matthew 24, he's giving them an answer. Okay. Um, Jesus replied, right? Right, he's telling them all of this. He's telling them all of this, what will happen with the arrests and all that. Right? And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all the nations. Then the end will come. Now this is connected to what we were told here. Okay. 
that he was telling them to hurry up in Matthew 10 because they wouldn't be able to go to all the cities in Judea or in Israel <coughs> before he comes back. It doesn't mean they didn't get to go anywhere. They did get to go many places. Uh, Thomas went to India and other people went to other, other places. But he's saying, hey, you need to hurry up. You don't have much time. So anyway, um, this gospel will be proclaimed throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. All right. And then he's talking about the abomination of desolation mentioned in Daniel. All right. He's telling them all about that. Then he's telling them many false Christs will come and all that. Don't go if, if they say he's here or there. Then he said, great suffering, right? Great tribulation. And right after that, right after that, there'll be the sign of the Son of Man appear in the sky. And then the angels come, they gather the chosen, right? So, and that's the end of it, right? And then he says, when all this is happening, you can tell that I'm at the door. And he's saying it on the parable of the fig tree. Nowhere it says that the fig tree is modern state Israel and that the generation is 70 years. It, it doesn't say any of it. <clears throat> he says, learn this parable from the fig tree. After its branch becomes tender and it sprouts new leaves, you know that the summer is near. He's just given a parable. When you see that a tree, right, is sprouting new leaves after the winter and all that, you know that the summer is near. And so in the same way, when all this that I have in blue here is happening, know that I'm at the door. That's all it means. Okay? And he says, I assure you, this generation, this that he's speaking to, this generation won't pass away until all these things happen, including his coming that he just described. What is a generation? Well, some say it's 70 or 80 years. Father tells me it's 40. Because... The Israelites were in, were in the desert for one generation, right? One generation for what? 40 years. So that the generation would die off, right? <clears throat> so that's a generation. But even if it's 70 or 80 years, he's talking to them right there, right then. It was instructions for them. For them. Back then. And he assured them. That their generation wasn't going to pass away until all these things has happened. Let's move on to Roman 8. For we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. Says Paul whenever he said it. And not only they, but ourselves too who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. He's saying that they are the first fruits already back then. Can you see? But not only they, but ourselves also who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Right? 1 Corinthians 15.51, right? It's speaking of those, of the order, right? Christ and the first fruits. and They had the first fruits of the Spirit, guys, already. All right, um, last scripture in 1 John 2.18. Little children, it is the last hour. Just as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have appeared. This is how we know it is the last hour. Okay. Like seriously. That was written back then. 
Do you think they were wrong, all of them? And Jesus somehow didn't know what he was saying when he was saying, well, it'll all happen to this generation. No, guys, no. It's all already happened. And we are now living at the time <coughs> of Revelation 28. We are being deceived into thinking we're at a completely different time. It's all already happened. I absolutely don't believe that we've been, that there's been 2,000 years space between Jesus Christ and us today. I don't believe it. The modern history, the way it's taught, there's more holes in it than, you know, in a, in, in a strainer. It's been fabricated. I have been watching independent researchers now for a long time. The evidence of a mass distraction on this earth prior to any of us being here I mean, this generation, people that are now alive, the evidence of destruction, even nuclear blasts, prior to any of us being alive, is very strong. Okay? It's all already happened. We are living in the post-apocalyptic age. We are the remaining, we were the remaining humans that multiplied to 8 billion right now. But the history is fabricated. Even just looking around at the architecture, okay? We were told that somehow these huge, 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 huge churches, right, from 12, 1300, these huge buildings, right? were built by these primitive people in like 12th century with with no technology whatsoever no no guys we have been deceived now does that mean there's no rapture does that mean that we're all gonna die here or something no it doesn't mean that i'm just telling you what we were basing our timelines on and all that has already happened No. If you want to argue it, go argue it. I don't mind. But first, go on your knees and you pray like you never prayed before for the Father to show you the truth. Put aside everything that you think you know. Everything that you think you know. And ask for the truth. You see, <coughs> Matthew 24 is the same outline as the book of Revelation. So, the seals already happened. The trumpets already happened. The vials already happened. It's all, it's all been done. But we see it being replayed, right? With Obama and the rest. We see it being replayed, guys. But it's not being done by our Father. It's being replayed by somebody, something, that wants you to believe that you're at the time of the book of Revelation, that you're at the time of the book of Matthew 24. You're not. Well, you're right at the end of it, but it's all already happened, so it's time we put it aside and start asking, Daddy, what do you want me to do? Why am I here? If it all already happened, why am I here? What's my job? Okay? Stop being so concerned with the rapture and the when and ask, all right, I'm here right now. It all already happened. Or show me that it all already happened in my heart. Con you know, convince me of it. Ask him. He will. 
And then ask him what, why you're here. What's your job? I guess that's enough for today. I love you all. Pray.